This is Deborah Tavares, and we're talking about the LED streetlights that are being deployed throughout the country. Um, and you may have noticed that these lights are going up in your towns and streets and parking lots. It's a new generation of pole-mounted lights that pour down a torrent of aluminum from an array of lighting. Um, and the most energy-efficient lighting option on the market right now are these lights. And they can last twice as long as the ordinary sodium vapor street lights. And their prices have dropped within range of competition. These prices have dropped, by the way, in range of competition to add to the genocide program. These lights cause vision damage. They uh, also interrupt our, me our melatonin. And I'm going to read you more. If the switch to LEDs had needed any more support, it came from the growing evidence about climate change. Again, a false, bogus science reality. They're building new markets in every direction from false science. The same thing is being and has been done with the illusion of, of uh, fossil fuel. We never received our petroleum from fossil fuel. The same thing with water. And water is a renewable energy resource, and we're being told that we have limited uses of water. And I want to talk, hopefully later in the program, about an enormous water scheme that is also occurring here in the Central Valley of Northern California. But to get back to these LED lights, we've all seen these lights coming on the market for a number of years, and we've heard that they may not be quite so good to us or and for us, and that they might cause health problems. But it's important to know that in the United States, the street lighting now accounts for 30% of the lighting of our streets. And of all the energy used to generate the electricity for outdoor lighting, another 60% goes towards lighting parking lots and garages. And much of that energy is still produced by fossil fuel. Again, a lie. Power plants and consultants at the first uh, Navigant in Chicago have um, told us that the United States could save 662 trillion British thermal units, the energy needed to power 5.8 million typical U.S. homes for one year by converting all remaining non-LAD outdoor lighting to LEDs. And we go on to find out that armed with statistics like this and a mandate to cut energy because of climate change, that the municipalities across the United States have installed more than 5.7 million outdoor LED light and area lights. Other towns and cities in Canada and Europe and Asia have added millions more over the past decade amid the rush to adopt outdoor LEDs the U.S. Department of Energy, another rogue um, corporate government agency, stressed energy efficiency as the biggest advantage of the new technology, while cautioning cities to also consider light output and color quality. But now that ordinary folks have got an eyeful of these new lights, some municipalities are coming down with opposition. And so it was at the meeting that I recently attended. They did not agree to have PG&E roll streetlights out. PG&E offered a trial test, a pilot program of some of the downtown areas of the city um, for free, they said, but then it was discussed at the meeting that no, indeed, the for free was not so. It was going to be in, in the rate structure and bill to the city. More importantly, PG&E admitted that they will have a dimming program of these lights. The dimming program of these lights, making dimmable lights, is, is in deploying smart meters on these lights. They are not only increasing um, light flicker rates that cause our ill health, but then it's all going to be designed around additional uh, wireless microwave fre frequencies that I've talked about many times on prior YouTubes, and this is all part of the genocide program. But they go on to say that the harsh glare of these blue rich designs is now thought to disrupt people's sleep patterns and harm nocturnal animals. 
and these concerns have been heaped on by the complaints of astronomers who as far back as 2009 has, have criticized these new lights. A disaster for dark skies and the environment, they're telling us. And lately, lighting companies have introduced these LED street lights with a warmer hue output, and municipalities have begun to adopt these lights. Some communities, too, are using smart lighting controls to minimize light pollution. Again, that would be dimmable. That would have smart meters and heavy pollution, not only the increased frequencies, but the, the um, detrimental effects of the lights themselves. And in the United States, we've switched over to an earlier generation of LEDs, which included those problematic blue-rich varieties at a potential of billions of dollars. We go on to find out that evidence has been mounting that increasing the blue light content of outdoor lighting can worsen its, our biological impact on humans and wildlife, leading to some who question the wisdom of putting LED street lights in their neighborhoods. We have long been adding light to the outdoor environment, but only in the past decade or two have experts become aware of the consequences for wildlife, human health, and residents, and the view of the night sky. A retired astronomer active in the flagship Dark Skies Coalition in Arizona has told us this, of their long concern uh, and inability to see the night skies due to this. We have studies that now have appeared from the Harvard Health uh, Publishing Medical School. It is called Blue Light Has a Dark Side, Harvard Health. And they go on to tell us that exposure to blue light at night emitted by electronics and energy efficient light bulbs can be harmful to your health. Again, this is all part of a stealth manipulation of a silent weapon system to be used against the global populations. And I'm pointing this out because there are solutions to this uh, assault with these lighting frequencies that we're now all facing. And I'm going to go into that in just a moment. But it is important to understand what Harvard University is telling us that until the advent of artificial lighting, the sun was the major source of lighting, and people spent their evenings in relative darkness. And now much of the world evenings are illuminated, and we can take our easy access to all these lumens pretty much for granted. But we are paying a price for basking in all this light. At night, light throws the body's biological clock, the circadian rhythm, rhythm out of whack. Sleep suffers. Worse research, research shows that it may contribute to the um, increased cancers, diabetes, and heart attack diseases, and even obesity. They go on that they know that exposure to light suppresses the secretion of melatonin, a hormone that influences circadian rhythms, and there's some experimental evidence that lower melatonin levels might explain the association with cancer. And in the Harvard research paper, they tell us what we can do. We can uh, use dim red lights for night lights. Red light has the least power to shift circadian rhythm and suppress melatonin. They said avoid looking at bright screens before going to bed at least two or three hours before you go to bed. And if you work a night shift or use a lot of electronic devices at night, they're telling us to consider wearing blue blocking glasses or installing an app that filters the blue light wavelength off our screens and laptops. They go on to tell us also exposure um, and expose yourself to lots of bright light during the day. Well, we know that that's not possible in many areas because we have a vellum of um, suppressed sunlight as a result of the artificial control of the weather. We're not getting the amount of disinfectant that we need and the opportunities from the sunlight. So, uh, of course, it seems like Harvard is also part and is part of the genocide program. But they go on to tell us um, that um, using less um, uh, blue light on laptops and so forth will add to the ability to sleep and as well as your mood and alertness during the daylight. We also have uh, information from IEEE, which means Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers, and they say 
LED lighting flicker and potential health concerns. And they start out in this advisement in their introduction. It says, this paper summarizes a public report created by the IEEE standards on LED lighting that is examining biological effects of flicker in emerging LED lighting technologies. The full-length version of this report can be found on grouper, G-R-O-U-P-E-R dot I-triple-E slash dot org. But you can just type in LED lighting flicker, flicker rate uh, I-triple-E in this document and will come right up. We will have it posted within this YouTube. The intention of this document is to provide an objective summary of the effects on human health for both visible and invisible flicker and to draw attention to implications for the design of LED lighting. Specifically, contributions of this paper include making the reader aware of risks of seizures due to the flicker rate, human biological effects due to invisible flicker at frequencies below 165 hertz, and the differences between visible flicker and invisible flicker rate, any, any relative health risks. Its purpose of, the, of letting us know about this is to describe the possible health implications of flicker by bringing these issues to the power electronic lamp designers. Now it will permit better ethical decisions and discussions to be made on the development of future LED lamps as the market continues to have explosive growth. There is no intention, of course, for this industry to change this silent weapons attack through lighting in all of our cities and all of our desktops. We're going to talk a little more about this, get into a little um, more of the solutions and possibilities to eliminate this assault upon us as well. We'll discuss that coming up. and we're talking about the LED lights that are rolling globally into all of our communities and in many other ways as well. We're exposing this in order to help reduce uh, blindness and the other eye diseases and maladies that are caused from the silent weapons insertion of even in our light bulbs. So um, I went to the Prevent Blindness website and they talked about things you could do and that uh, in fact, cause this blue light. They're calling it LED as blue light. And they're saying that uh, fluorescent lighting, CFL, compact for fluorescent light bulbs, uh, LED light, flat screen LED televisions, computer monitors, smartphones, and tablet screens. They're also warning us that a recent NEI-funded study shows that children's eyes absorb more blue light than adults from digital device screens. And what are our children doing? They're addicted to all types of electronics. This is not by accident. This is going to cause a tremendous amount of inability to see and have vision problems. Again, the... Um, a uh, corporate pharma take, farm, big pharma takeover of all of us is to create problems for all of us, death uh, and impacts on our health. So getting back to the IEEE document that I was discussing, they're telling us that about the flicker rate, that the health effects of flipper, flicker rates can be divided into these uh, that are the immediate result of a few seconds of flicker exposure, such as epileptic seizures. People can have epileptic seizures. And those that are less obvious result of long-term exposure, such as malaise, which is tiredness, headaches, and impaired visual performance. They go on to say that the human biological effects are a function of flicker frequency, modulation, depth, brightness, lighting, application, and several other factors. About one in 4,000 individuals is recognized as having photosensitive epilepsy. Repetitive flashing lights and static repetitive geometric patterns may induce seizures in these individuals and in perhaps as 
many, again, who have not been diagnosed and may be unaware that they are at risk. The seizures reflect the transient, abnormal, synchronized activity of brain cells affecting consciousness, body movements, and or sensation. The onset of photosensitive epilepsy occurs typically at around the time of puberty. In the age group of 7 to 20 years, the condition is five times as common. Uh, there are several studies showing that the characteristics of human eye movement across text are affected by modulation from fluorescent lights. It's important just to understand the assault upon us with these lights and the biological effects. I'm going to read to you out of the AMA, and this is quite startling about blindness because we know that we have increased cataracts, increased macular degeneration. People are going blind at uh, younger and uh, younger ages, and how you can avoid this is to understand that this is an assault by those in power to create ill effects for all of us. And by knowing this, you can make different decisions. So here's what the AMA, the American Medical Association, has to say about LED lighting. They have made three recommendations in a new policy statement. First, the AMA supports a proper conversation in community-based light-emitting lighting, which reduces energy consumption and decreases the use of fossil fuels. The AMA is part of the genocide program. It's extremely important, again, to understand that we are the enemy. We have a de facto government posing as a government, and we are under massive genocide programs globally. And I talked about the genocide treaty in uh, the last uh, program, and I want to refer to that. This is a massive genocide program. Second, they say that the AMA encourages minimizing and controlling blue-rich environmental lighting by using the lowest emission of blue light possible to reduce glare. They also encourage the use of 3,000 kilowatts or lower lighting for indoor installation, such as roadways. All LED lighting should be properly shielded properly shielded to minimize the glare and detrimental human and environmental effects. And consideration should be given to utilize the ability of LED lighting to be dimmed for off-peak time periods. So the AMA is encouraging the dimmable approach of LED lighting in all of our city streets and parking structures and uh, in inter, uh, the interchanges, etc., by using additional smart meters so that these um, systems can be turned down or up. Deborah Tavares, we're going to be picking up on the LED lights, and the intention behind this is, of course, to disrupt our sleep so that we're not able to get into the deep sleep necessary for the recovery of our immune systems for, from the prior day's wear and tear. These lights are being deployed in throughout our communities. People are now complaining about them. They're trying to put blackout drapes in front of their windows. They're finding that the light still comes in through the cracks. It has been an enormous disruption here in Northern California community of Sebastopol. And because people went to their city council meeting armed with the AMA literature, albeit based on climate change and fossil fuels, uh, and the IEEE documentation, they were able to um, sway the council at this time to not take on Rothschild, a.k.a. PG&E's, gracious opportunity of deploying these health-reducing lights throughout the community. It's important to understand what has already happened. They say the LEDs that are from the 4,000 to 5,000 kilowatts contains high levels of short wavelength blue light, and this has been the choice for a number of cities 
that have recently retrofitted their street lighting, such as Seattle and New York. So if you are listening from any of those locations or anywhere on this planet, you need to understand that the lighting will cause eye damage, sleep disruption. Certainly it also impacts the wildlife. They're going to be retrofitting uh, cities throughout the country and the world, and according to the AMA, the first discomfort that most of us will notice uh, will be the glare. And they tell us in the case of white LED light, it's established to be five times more effective at suppressing melatonin at night than the high-pressure sodium lamps given the same light output, which have been the mainstay of street lighting for decades. Melatonin suppression is a marker of the circadian disruption, which includes disrupted sleep. Bright electric lighting also adverses uh, effectively wildlife. And for example, disturbing um, birds and patterns of migration of birds and some aquatic animals that are next to the shoreline. So I'm going to jump into a, a, a shoreline situation that I have discussed before, but it bears uh, repeating. Uh, we are being hit in many ways along our shorelines. For those of you, I would certainly uh, ask that you watch The Cooking of Humanity. It is a direct assault upon the shorelines of the United States, but it is a global shoreline assault with frequencies. And I'm going to talk about, uh, in the NASA war document on page 59, they talk about the blast wave accelerator. They say that it is a global precision strike on the cheap. It's an excellent stealth with no plume. The affordability and veracity and the reaction time, survivability, and effectiveness. And they go on to say that this is what the blast wave accelerator was created originally for and what it was engaged to do. Again, this is on page 59. It's important to know that in 1944, the U.S. military was working with the New Zealand government to develop a devastating tsunami bomb to send a 33-foot wave crashing into Japan's coastline designed to destroy coastal cities. They say it's an excellent stealth, no plume, top secret tsunami bomb from World War II. This was the planned backup weapon if Fat Man and Little Boy the code names for the two atomic bombs dropped over Japan in World War II had they failed to detonate. Codenamed Project SEAL, the weapons of mass destruction revealed on a series of ten large, um, or it, it relied on a series of ten large offshore blasts and was tested off the coast of New Caledonia and in Auckland and is now being worked on as the blast wave accelerator. So, again, um, the myriad of assaults with the weapon systems that have been designed to create global weapon and weather um, hardships and death and destruction across the globe is now being amplified. We have uh, noticed, of course, the increase in the historical weather events throughout the United States and globally, fires in Portugal and Spain, uh, again, directed energy weapons. Uh, in Russia, a number of years ago, there were massive fires, and when we were traveling there, we were hearing the discussion and the consequences of those fires. It really uh, paid a heavy toll on the aging Russian uh, population, and of course, we're being told that the older people are useless eaters, and uh, they have to be eliminated, and of course the very young as well. So the types of weapons that we are facing is astronomical, but by knowing what we're facing, you can take certain actions, at least the best ones you can make. By not knowing, you don't avail yourself to opportunities to minimize certain assaults on your body. We all know that the food supply has been poisoned. We know that the clothing from overseas has poisons and toxins in it. We can make informed decisions so that we can survive as long as we are able to. 
I encourage all of you to go to StopTheCrime.net, uh, look up the um, health symptoms from all wireless devices printed off. I also want you to all be aware that uh, for many of you that had not been aware of the addition of Cinemax into our food supply. What is Cinomix? It's S-E-N-O-M-Y-X. You'll find this on StopTheCrime.net, but you can just type it in your search bar as well. It is uh, what they add to many beverages and foods, and we shouldn't be consuming it. So what is it? Uh, during the Obama administration, uh, there was a ruling uh, that PepsiCo was cannibalizing aborted fetus of ordinary as an ordinary business. What do I mean by that? Well, aborted fetuses that were still alive must be killed to be used in Cinemix. And they go on to say that uh, the Obama agency rules PepsiCo cannibalizing aborted fetuses as ordinary business. Shareholders would not be informed or allowed to vote on the resolution. And they go on to say it was a shocking decision delivered February the 28th of 2012. President Obama's Security and Exchange Commission ruled that PepsiCo's use of aborted fetal tissue remains in their research and development agreement with Cinemix to produce flavor enhancers and falls under ordinary business operations. It's important for all of you to download what Cinemix is in and not buy these products. Cannibalism increases anger. The globalists, of course, are um, reveling in the fact that we're cannibalizing our own people, our own human beings. They're reveling in this. So some of the products that were um, shown to have Cinemex in it, and I'll list just a few. Um, this um, company, by the way, is in La Jolla in Southern California, and it's called Fla it's for flavor enhancement. It's an excito um, chemical reaction on your tongue to make you want what you're eating, and it is legal. So some of the products include Pepsi, Mountain Dew, um, Aquafina, juices like Tropicana, Dole, Ocean Spray, Lipton Teas, Quaker Oat Cereals, and Granola Bars, Frito-Lay Chips, uh, Doritos, um, Ruffles. There's many. Coffees have this in it. Some of the Seattle's best coffees and Frappuccinos. Um, Cadbury products. Uh, Kraft Foods now include um, in chewing Trident gums, uh, Dentine, Clorets, Chiclets, um, Halls, Lozengers, and Cadbury chocolates. Again, this is a list that was determined to have Cinemix in it, and there's many more listed on this. You can download this for yourself. Uh, certainly, I know that people that are aware that uh, products contain Cinemix are not buying it. It's added to pet foods. It's um, added to, uh, again, drinks, as I mentioned, to uh, dryers, um, Extreme and haagen ice creams, uh, Nestle, uh, Nest Nestle ice cream, uh, pet foods, um, cat chow, and uh, dog chow, uh, fancy feast. And um, this is just an advisory. Again, download the Cinemix flyer uh, on the Internet, um, and we'll be back in just a moment for the final segment of this program. It has been a privilege to be the co-host on today's Power Hour uh, for Daniel, and um, my intention of the information that you're hearing is not to evoke fear. Fear is how the controllers win when we cower. We must look at all the alternatives available to us to prevent the personal assaults on our physical bodies. I've talked many times about methods and ways in which we can reduce that, getting off of all wireless as much as possible. Certainly now with the discussion with the LED lights, it is illustrating the intention of causing eye damage, cell damage, reducing our sleep, also affecting animals. 
uh, again, you can go to your cities and look on your agendas and find out if there's any opportunity for you to go there and make your cities aware. Again, your cities are incorporated. They really honestly do not serve us. What I have realized is that, is that some of the city council members truly believe they do in some way. But because the meetings are Delphi, we're only given a few minutes to talk, basically just to um, create the illusion that there is public comment, don't be frustrated if your city rolls right over you with the best of documentation that you may present. But what is important when you go to these meetings and you speak up is that other people in the audience hear, and that's how you spread information, because most cities replay their agendas, and people can watch those meetings in their homes. This is important. While it seems frustrating and nonproductive, I have uh, come to know this. Um, we have had people tell us that when our groups go into the city, they perk up. They're happy that we're there. So, again, I want to refer you to StopTheCrime.net. Please go to our YouTube page. Look at uh, the recent YouTubes that we have put up so that you can take uh, action and implement solutions for your health as best possible. I want to conclude in the program today um, about the concern of EMP attack up, up on the United States. That's an electromagnetic pulse. Many of you might be familiar with the book, One Second After. If you are not, I would suggest you read it because it certainly uh, demonstrates what it would be like if all of our electronics went out. And the reason I'm saying this to you is there are about eight pages in the NASA war document that talk about the kinds of weapons that will be used um, against the continental United States and globally as well. And um, so one of these pages that talks about the EMP in the NASA war document is page 48. And it says that these are the types of uh, weapons that will be used. EMP, again, that's for electric magnetic pulse. Uh, Cywar, um, they talk about um, brilliant sensors, fuel and air dust. They talk about chemical and biologicals. They talk about um, other types of um, acoustics, and we heard about the acoustic attacks for uh, the, poli the presumed politicians that were visiting Cuba, and they suffered uh, headaches and actually some reduction of their uh, brain capacity the way it has been described in Times Magazine when they went to visit Cuba. They were assaulted by an acoustic weapons system. But... Um, Again, we're being told in the NASA war plan the types of, of smart dust and explosions, uh, EMPs that will be used. One thing that is extremely disturbing about the advocates that are trying to um, provide the information necessary for the White House to implement and harden up our EMP uh, in the United States is that uh, many of those people believe we have a representative government. So they're taking the documents to the White House in hopes that Congress and legislators will take this on as uh, as a um, bill. There is no such thing. Many of you can go yourselves, but like us, we have gone to the White House and we have passed out um, smart meter information and we have passed out uh, the um, artificially controlled weather information to no available, uh, to no avail. And the Department of Energy also was given all these documents and it was to a voiceless group of actors. We have imposters posing as a government, and they're not. The sooner we understand that, the sooner we stop agreeing by voting, the sooner we stop um, thinking the false reality that we have all been sold, the safer, hopefully, we might be. But, again, an EMP is a really th a, an enormous threat because with it being listed so many times in the NASA war plan, which is a takedown plan, not only potentially for the United States, but other countries as well. One second after book reveals what it would look like if the grid went down. Millions and millions of people would die. And this would certainly be in alignment with the genocide plan. 
again, Rothschild and Rockefeller are hitting the northern um, United States or North America with diabolical genocide plans, and we're going to discuss those at greater length in upcoming shows. So I would ask, again, that you um, not only send uh, donations to StopTheCrime.net, but to also support the Power Hour in their efforts to stay on air and provide you with this kind of information. It's critical that we help one another in all ways that we're able to. So I would urge you to go and listen to uh, our recent YouTubes. They're very important. Uh, send them on. Uh, get them on Facebook. Please pass this information out. Uh, I am uh, in here in Northern California. I am witnessing diabolical policies rolling in like a blast wave accelerator. It feels like a tsunami coming over us. The enormity of the destruction here in Northern California from the lasers that caused these fires, a.k.a. pg e and Rothschild, is nothing short of diabolical. We have hundreds and hundreds of families that are displaced. We have people that are leaving the area because of lack of housing. We have a rental market under Airbnb. Airbnb are the vacation rentals. It is run by Google. Very important to understand that. Google runs Airbnb. They're absorbing all of our month-to-month -month occupancy rental availability and turning it into vacation rentals so that there is no permanency here. And um, I will be on the air next Thursday. Looking forward to divulging more information to all of you. Go to StopTheCrime.net. Please support the Power Hour. Thank you so much.